in the H.G. Wells novel, entitled, Time Machine, society one million years in the future, has evolved into two separate species, called, Morlocks and Eloy. The Morlocks represent the ugly dirty producers who buy this future age, all live underground, and run the world's manufacturing. The Eloy are the effect of the inbreeding of the elite, who by this time are simple-minded Aryan, above-ground dwellers, living in idleness, and consuming only what the Morlocks produce. What was the trade-off? The Morlocks periodically rise above ground in hunting parties to kidnap and eat unsuspecting Eloy in this symbiotically vicious circle of life. This famous story was written by a young British writer in 1893, whose ideas and pioneering work in shaping new techniques of cultural warfare, which profoundly affected the next 130 years of human history. These ideas led to the innovation of novel techniques of predictive programming and to mass psychological warfare. In contrast to the optimistic views of mankind and the future potential envisioned by the great science fiction writer Jules Verne earlier, Wells' misanthropic tales had the intended effect of reducing the creative potential and love of humanity that Verne's work awoke. To restate the technique more clearly, by shaping society's imagination of the future and embedding existential nihilistic outcomes within his plotlines, Wells realized that the entire zeitgeist of humanity could be affected on a profound level than simple conscious reason would permit. Since he robed his poison in the cloth of fiction, the minds of those receiving his stories would find their critical thinking faculties disengaged and would simply take in all Trojan horses embedded in the stories into their unconsciousness. This has been an insight used for over a century by social engineers and intelligence agencies, whose aim has always been the willing enslavement of all people of the Earth. While he is best known for such fiction works as The War of the Worlds, The World Set Free, The Invisible Man, The Island of Dr. Morrow, and The Time Machine, Wells' lesser-known non-fiction writings, like The Open Conspiracy, The New World Order, The Outline of History, The Science of Life and The World Brain, served as guiding strategic blueprints for the entire 20th century war against sovereign nation-states, and the very idea of a society built on the premise of mankind, made in the image of God. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you've learned something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update. And, watch to the end, to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. The members of the London-centered oligarchy to which Wells had devoted himself at an early age, had found themselves stuck in a rut by the turn of the 19th century. These inbred families and retainers, who managed the dying British Empire, had long been encrusted by the vices of decadence, by the time a young man of low breeding and high talent arose amidst the London ghettos, treating syphilis patients as a surgeon's assistant. This young surgeon's name was, Thomas Huxley. Huxley possessed a sardonic wit, a deep misanthropy, and an intelligence that were soon discovered by powerful patrons, and by his mid-twenties, this young man found himself a rising star in Britain's Royal Academy of Science. Here he quickly became a leading creative force, shaping Britain's powerful ex-club, serving as Darwin's bulldog, promoting popular debates featuring himself against literalist members of the clergy. In these debates, he argued for Darwin's chaos-bound interpretation of evolution. He also founded Nature magazine as a propaganda instrument, which has been used to enforce scientific consensus, favorable to a world empire to this very day. Huxley chose his opponents carefully, ensuring that he could easily and publicly obliterate the arguments of simple-minded Anglican clergy, and thus, convince all onlookers that the only choice they had to account for the evolution of new species was either literal biblical creationism or his brand of Darwinian evolution. The many alternative scientific theories of the 19th century, such as those found in the works of Karl Ernst von Baer, Georges Cuvier, Lamarck, and James D. Dana, which accounted for both the evolution of species and the harmonics of all parts to a whole, as well as creative leaps, were forgotten amidst this false dichotomy, which this author unpacked in a recent interview on YouTube, entitled, How Darwinism Took Over the World and Why Erdogrill is Awesome. Link in the description box below. During his later years, Huxley mentored a young H.G. Wells, together with a whole generation of new imperial practitioners of the arts of social engineering and social Darwinism. This social engineering soon took the form of Galton's eugenics, quickly becoming an accepted science practiced across the Western world. 
Wells was himself the son of a lowly gardener, but, like Huxley, exhibited a strong misanthropic wit, passion, and creativity, lacking in the high nobility, and he was thus raised from the lower ranks of society into the order of oligarchical management by the 1890s. During this moment of vast potential, and, it cannot be restated enough, the oligarchical order that had grown overconfident during the 200-plus years of hegemony, were petrified to see the nations of the earth rapidly breaking free from this hegemony, thanks to the under the international spread of Lincoln's American system across Germany, Russia, Japan, South America France, Canada, and even China, with Sun Yat-sen's 1911 Republican Revolution. As outlined in Cynthia Chung's YouTube video, entitled, Why Russia Saved the USA, the oligarchy just no longer seemed to have the creative vitality and sophistication required to snuff out these revolutionary flames. Wells described this problem in the following terms. The undeniable contraction of the British outlook in the opening decade of the new century is one that has exercised my mind very greatly. Gradually, the belief in the possible world leadership of England had been deflated by the economic development of America and the militant boldness of Germany. The long reign of Queen Victoria, so prosperous, progressive and effortless, had produced habits of political indolence and cheap assurance. As a people we had got out of training, and when the challenge of these new rivals became open, it took our breath away at once. We did not know how to meet it. The Science of Population Control, advanced by Huxley, Galton, Wells, Mackinder, Milner and Bertrand Russell, was the basis for a new scientific priesthood and world government that would put a stop to the startling disequilibrium, unleashed by the electric spread of sovereign nation-states, protectionism and commitment to scientific and technological progress. H.G. Wells, Russell and other early social engineers of this new priesthood, organized themselves in several interconnected think tanks, known as 1. The Fabian Society of Sydney and Beatrice Webb, which operated through the London School of Economics, 2. The Round Table Movement, begun by the fortunes left to posterity by the racist diamond magnate Cecil Rhodes, which also gave rise to the Rhodes Trust and Rhodes Scholarship programs established to indoctrinate young talent in the halls of Oxford, and finally, 3. The Coefficients Club of London. As noted by Georgetown professor Carol Quigley, in his 1981 The Anglo-American Establishment, membership in all three organizations was virtually interchangeable. Wells described the rise of these original think tanks and documented the inner elite's inability to meet the challenge of the times, saying, our ruling class, protected in its advantages by a universal snobbery, was broad-minded, easy-going, and profoundly lazy. Our liberalism was no longer a larger enterprise, it had become a generous indolence. But minds were waking up to this. Over our table at St. Ermin's Hotel Wrangell Max, Bel Airs, Ewans, Amery and Mackinder, all stung by the small but humiliating tale of disasters in the South African War, all sensitive to the threat of business recession, and all profoundly alarmed by the naval and military aggressiveness of Germany. Fearful of the prospect of a U.S.-Russia-China alliance outlined in depth by Fabian Roundtable members Halford Mackinder and Lord Alfred Milner, the solution was simple. Kick over the chessboard and get everyone to just slaughter each other. Accounts of the British imperial efforts to orchestrate this war have been told in many locations. In the wake of the destruction which left 9 million dead on all sides and ruined countless lives, Wells, Russell and the Milner Roundtable became leading voices for world government under the League of Nations, advocating enlightened cosmopolitanism to replace the era of selfish nation-states. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. All is appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. Thanks for watching this video. This Everything Inside Me channel, see you on the next video. Stay safe and healthy.